final session today where we think about um, our role in creating a global community is thinking about the relationship that, that we have um, collectively with, um, with MDS. So let me find my presentation. Called that one. So it's great um, to be able to um, speak this, this afternoon. It's, it's fantastic coming to WPC, isn't it? Because it's a great opportunity to catch up with, with colleagues from around the world. And I think just through the conversations um, that I've already had today, this recognition that that since we last met in, in Montreal, so much has happened. Um, our organizations have all moved on, lots of exciting plans and programs that are being put in, in place. I just wanted to talk a, a bit, and I suppose a bit of a kind of case study for change, really, around the changes that have, have happened at, at Parkinson's UK and, and the new strategy that we've launched, which you'll, you'll see a copy of on, 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 on the table, and please do um, take that if you'd find it helpful, which is focused ar around this, uh, this grand objective of bringing forward the day when no one fears Parkinson's. So I, I suppose this slide in, in many ways kind of sums up how I would say Parkinson's UK is now different than when we met in Montreal three years ago. Um, three years ago, I would say that we were having limited success in influencing the fortress of the NHS. We would be able to persuade the NHS, the National Health Service, to employ a nurse here or to, make, to put in place an education program there, but it felt we were on the outside um, and um, our impact was, was um, limited. Now, um, we can show that we're right at the heart of the NHS, working with um, health professionals to, to drive change. The second box talks about how um, three years ago, our focus was let's, let's fund the very best university research, and we'll hope that if it's good, that, that just kind of naturally that will trickle down into the new treatments that people were looking for. Whereas now, there's much more of a proactive um, leadership role that we take across the whole um, Parkinson's research um, um, the drug development um, program pipeline. And then the third bit on the bottom row, a, a sense, I suppose, three years ago that our focus was to be a supportive organization, to, to be there to support um, people with Parkinson's when they needed help and support. Whereas now much more of a sense of a movement of people living with the condition, sharing their own ideas and inspiration about how to take control. So how did we bring about these changes? Um, well, one of the important values that we have in, in Parkinson's UK is this sense of listening, that everything we do um, comes from listening to people with Parkinson's. So whether that's, um, you know, you come for an interview um, at Parkinson's UK, there will be someone with um, Parkinson's who is on the interview panel. And, and the expectation is that in every aspect of your job, you will involve, you will work with, you will listen to people with Parkinson's. So we asked the question, what three things would change your life with Parkinson's? What three things would change your life with Parkinson's by 2020? We wanted to be more specific. That would be the strategic period. So we had... Um, thousands of responses to that question involving our network, um, written responses, online responses, and, and, and then a whole range of kind of focus groups um, and meetings trying to explore that. That took a number of months. It was frustrating, actually, for our staff who were saying, hang on, we're doing the strategic review, and, and with all these conversations, when do we get our say? But actually, I had to remind people that this is about listening to what people with Parkinson's say are the priorities first. Your opportunity will, will come later on. So what, what was clear through hearing all of those responses was that actually people with Parkinson's were demanding huge change, significant change. Um, and that, that we, on our own as a charity, would be unable to deliver that. We needed to, to find new partnerships um, and, and influence and inspire um, 
other people to, to do the important work, that effectively we needed to develop a strategy not for Parkinson's UK, but a strategy for, for Parkinson's the condition. So what came out of that listening exercise were, were three very clear themes, three challenges that the Parkinson's community set us. So the first one was about better treatments and a cure in years, not decades. The second one was people said they wanted to be empowered to take control, live life to the full in a society that understands Parkinson's. And the third one was around people having access to quality health and social care services wherever they live, whatever age, whatever stage of the, the condition, with that being guaranteed. So having got that as, as, the, um, as the challenge that had been set by the community, we then entered a, a, a new phase, which was about talking to, um, to people, our partners, inspiring our partners who could work with us on this. Um, so we then in, went into a phase of, of, of working with a whole range of different, different groups and inspiring them, really, with this kind of challenge that had been set by the Parkinson's community. So first of all, under that, that first theme, better treatments and, and a cure, it meant getting people together who could make a difference in, in this area. So involving um, workshops um, where we brought together um, academic researchers, um, industry, um, biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, um, regulators, um, to, to map out the whole process. And it was really interesting in those conversations. People saying, you know, I've never spoken to a regulator before. I, I never really thought through what needed to happen for, for, um, for my basic science to be turned into a, a, a new treatment. We also involved, engaged the Parkinson's community and researchers and clinicians in identifying the top 10 research priorities, something called the Priority Setting Partnership that the James Lind Alliance um, lead. With quality services as, as standard, we wanted to make sure um, that health professionals really owned and, and were bought into the, the solution or, or designing a solution that would de deliver the, the change that people wanted to, to, to see. So again, lots of workshops involving people from all over the, the UK and, and, and all clinical groupings as well. A real sense of co-production um, in, in, in developing the solution here. And we spent time looking um, around the world as well. I remember before going to Montreal, spending time with the National Parkinson Foundation, looking at their Centers of Excellence program, um, and um, spending time in the Netherlands with Bas Bloom and the Parkinson's Net thing. If I tell you, actually, that um, the first draft of our plans were written in a cafe in Amsterdam, um, you might think, you might think, well, that explains why they were so, um, so, yeah, you get my point. Um, <laughs> And then the, the third theme, it's recognizing that when we're talking about taking control, who are the experts? The experts are those people living with Parkinson's, who've been living with Parkinson's for um, a significant um, amount of time, who have worked out what it is, um, that it, it, what, it, what you need to do to be able to, to, to take control. So again, um, a series of, of workshops with, with experts, developing a framework for what we mean by taking control. P um, people with Parkinson's came up with six, um, six elements of what we call our taking control architecture. Um, and, and we tested that with lots of different groups um, to, to sense whether we got the language right, whether we were talking about it in, in the right way, and working with people across the UK to identify what services, what support needs to be av available in every community in order that people can um, take control. We've got 38 volunteers who are doing that mapping work now. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time then talking about what came out of those discussions in, in terms of the programs that we've put in place and just three short um, videos that will illustrate this. At Parkinson's UK, everything we do is driven by people with Parkinson's. So we're striving for new and better treatments in years rather than decades. But where do new treatments come from? 
The first step towards a new treatment is finding out what goes wrong in Parkinson's and coming up with ideas for how to fix it. Next, dedicated teams attempt to turn the most promising scientific discoveries into potential new treatments. Newly developed treatments that have proven to be safe and effective in the lab now need to be carefully tested in people in clinical trials. Finally, any new treatment needs to be officially approved before it can be made available. But despite huge scientific progress, there have been no major advances in the treatments available for Parkinson's in the last decade. There isn't enough investment and developing new treatments is taking too long. So that's where we come in. We're adopting a radical new approach to speed up the whole process and deliver treatments to people who need them faster. We're unlocking scientific discoveries by backing the best and brightest minds to unlock ideas that will lead to new treatments and one day a cure. We're investing in developing treatments by taking the best ideas wherever they come from and rapidly turning them into treatments that can be tested and progressed. We believe that clinical trials can work better so we're bringing the right people together to make trials faster, cheaper and more likely to succeed. And we're taking the fastest route to better treatments by tracking down drugs that are already approved and in use for other conditions which have untapped potential for Parkinson's. Whoever you are, please help us deliver new and better treatments for Parkinson's in years, not decades. So I hope you can see that that, there's, um, that, that is a, a new approach, um, and we talk about it as being a radical new approach. One of the elements of that um, is recognizing, actually, that, one, that we think that clinical trials have failed, not necessarily because the science has, has, has not been good, but because trials have been poorly um, designed. So we, we've launched this, this initiative, the Critical Path for Parkinson's, with the Critical Path Institute, and Diane is, is over there who's leading this program. This brings together, it's now nine industry partners, um, so all of the major pharmaceutical companies. It brings together um, significant university researchers, including the, the PPMI project in, in, um, led by the Fox Foundation. And it, it's about pulling all of that data together, those companies working together in a pre-competitive way so that we can come up with a new industry standard around how clinical trials are done that are more likely to be successful. We think this is a really significant um, development in the field of Parkinson's. And there's a, a session on Friday afternoon um, this week where you can, you can hear about that in, in more detail. The, the second initiative is, is around us establishing the Parkinson's UK virtual biotech in that whole um, issue of drug discovery, wanting to work like a company, I guess, with those same kind of commercial approaches of identifying um, some of those possible new, um, new treatments and putting them through a very um, focused and rigorous uh, way of testing those and then if, if, if everything looks positive, then being able to hand that over to pharmaceutical companies, having de-risked that part of the process, having invested in a stage where they're likely to want to, 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 to invest. Doing it in a more commercial way, looking to attract investors in, in, in this kind of work, but again, um, accelerating the process um, and expanding what we're able to do. We've committed to doubling the amount of money that we spend on research over the next five years. So the, the next in initiative, was the next challenge, was that quality services as, as standard. And so our big initiative there was the launch of the Excellence Network. I guess the principle here is that um, our, our mechanism in the past had been to try and use kind of political type means to improve the care for people with Parkinson's. But the reality was that that was never going to be, it was never going to be politicians who would be able to create laws or, 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 or standards that would transform change. We needed to work with clinical champions um, to, um, to, to, to align our resources with them to enable clinical champions to drive change. So we launched something called the Excellence Network about 18 months ago. And, and this video um, is, was, was filmed on, on the day of the launch. Oh, sorry. Can we start that again? How do we develop Parkinson's services? It's a bit like 
a game of snakes and ladders. And it seems to me that the snakes are really significant. The increasing demand, the increasing expectations, doing a lot more with a lot less resource. In the NHS, as it stands at the moment, there isn't a lot of extra resource out there. So it's really important to make the most of what we have already. There aren't that many physios who are specialised in Parkinson's. People with Parkinson's disease sadly often don't get access to a speech and language therapist. It's essential that, you know, Parkinson's gets a high profile. You know, we look at the newspapers and we see crisis in a&E or issues around cancer and, and, and that's where the focus is. So those snakes, they really stop us. And at the end of the day we need to remember why we're there and we're there for our patients. Starting with the patient and then de developing and designing the services around them is where we're going to have to go. There's an awful lot of people doing an awful lot of good in Parkinson's disease but people are, are working in their own little silos. So I see the UK Parkinson's Excellence Network as a glorious opportunity to take wonderful ideas from professionals from all over the country to share and disseminate more widely, to reach out to other professionals locally and across the UK so no one need feel professionally isolated. The problem is I have a head full of clinical experiences which I have never been able to share with anyone else. And we're all sometimes reinventing the wheel and that can be avoided. Finding better ways to work together. Standardisation of care. Sharing what's really good about the way we work. Sharing innovative practice. Sharing expertise and best practice. We can save time and effort by not reinventing the wheel. Building an expert workforce. We're all in this together. And it allows me to tap into other people's experience and expertise. Link with all the other specialists nationally. It's going to drive standards upwards. So we launched the Excellence Network um, 18 months ago now. We've, we've um, got something like 40 clinical leaders. And you can't see the photos here, but a number of these people are, are internationally um, renowned clinicians, researchers who have taken on a leadership role, perhaps for a theme uh, across the Excellence Network or, or geograph geographical patch. We've got over 3,000 health professionals who are in, in, involved and, and signed up to, to the Excellence Network. Um, and, and so it is about what this slide describes, starting off with um, listening to the voice of service users and building services around them. It's, it's about building the expert workforce, um, equipping professionals to influence services, and then together working for, for, for change. So we've already um, conducted the, the UK's largest ever audit of, of Parkinson's care. We had 424 services across the UK who audited their care. This involved looking at 9,000 medical records, we had getting on for 9,000 people with Parkinson's, um, describing their services, their local uh, um, clinical services, and giving feedback. Um, so as a consequence, what's, what the Excellence Network was able to do was to, to tackle actually its five key priority um, challenges, and then together um, set about um, across the UK um, working out how we can deliver those challenges. And I guess these are probably the kind of things that you would um, recognize um, within your health system. So it's, it's um, the, the lack of access to a full multidisciplinary team, um, the lack of information that people receive at diagnosis, addressing um, patient, um, issues of, of people getting their medicine in hospital, um, standardized assessments across all of the different clinical groups, um, and, and then having those difficult conversations with, with people around um, anticipatory care, end-of-life issues, advanced Parkinson's issues. So those are our priorities, and, and there are clinicians um, up and down the, the UK working together now um, with, with access to service development funds um, supported by conferences and education programs so that we've got a national UK-wide um, um, plan to develop these priorities and, and I hope that in three years time um, at the next um, WPC we'll be able to really demonstrate um, system-wide change in, in, in these priority areas. So then our third um, focus was this one around um, empowering people to, to, to take control. 
Um, and as I said, um, people with Parkinson's identified six um, approaches that are really important, and, and this has led to us um, transforming the resources that, that we produce. This is, is just one of our first videos um, that, that, that we've been using to promote this new approach. I did the wrong thing and looked on the internet, so I got all the wrong messages basically telling me my life was over. You go to a downward spiral, and then you come out the other side. I have since learned that isn't the case. To be in control of anything, you really need to know what's what. You can control it very well with medication, movement and exercise. And some people like to hide their illnesses, but I don't. I told everybody honestly, that I have got Parkinson. You don't have to cope with it on your own. It's amazing how important hugs were. I do, do like hugs. There's a lot of really genuine people. Problem shared is a problem halved. I've been very lucky, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Some of it was just simply, like, come on, we're going to go for a good walk. I want to get this out of my system and we're going to talk about it. He's always been very positive. You have to maintain a positive outlook. And it's not just about me anyway, it's about the boys. So you have to have a positive attitude about it. If something does go wrong, don't get worried at all. It's all about positive attitude. You can do most things you want to do, it just takes a lot more time, effort and planning. I make a lot of lists, I do things in advance. Challenge yourself to work around it. I go home and I kind of re-energise myself. I see my girlfriends and I see my family, I get re-energised and then I come back. I think you need a variety of things in your life. When I'm doing karate, I'm in control. It certainly has helped me big time. I must exercise, 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 exercise. <laughs> I still get down to the allotment. I've got some wonderful marrows. Love shopping and I love going out to eat. I cooked a meal today. It's a great thing. I've cooked a meal for someone else. Even better. If I can do a small amount that to help someone in a similar situation as myself, so be it. We're actually creating our own community. Get involved. Don't spend your time worrying about what the future might be. Well, it's not an illness, it's a condition. Take each day as it comes. Every day is going to be a good day, hopefully. My focus is not on Parkinson's, it's on living. Don't let this thing ruin your life. Don't wait for someone to come along and help you. Go out and help yourself. Be positive. Be positive, live today. I might have Parkinson's, but the Parkinson's doesn't have me. So moving that, that forward, it is, as I say, that recognition that people with Parkinson's are the experts and that we need to find ways of, of enabling those experts to provide inspiration to others as, as much as possible. Um, we've, we've set about um, what I think is a really ambitious program for us to develop what we're calling a personalized relationship with the 10,000 people diagnosed with Parkinson's in the UK um, every year. So that involves working with the clinicians, working with the excellence network, making sure that, that we can automatically be put in touch with everybody and then proactively provide support um, uh, for, for people at every stage of the condition. And, and that, as you can imagine, involves a significant investment in digital um, and we are looking um, through our Parkinson's Links program with all of our local groups on how we can develop access to local services, particularly exercise, therapeutic activities like singing and dancing, um, and, and that sense of mutual support for, for people with Parkinson's and their, their partners. So I hope you get a sense from, from, from that, that there's significant change that, that is happening at Parkinson's UK. We really have... Um, turned the charity on, on its head through, through those programs. Um, it, it's only the start of the process and, and we're learning lots of, of lessons as, as we go through. I, I think the first for me is that, that when you do this and when you really listen to what people say, you need to be ready to challenge everything that you do, challenge all of the roles, all of the functions that, 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 you've, um, that you've taken on in the past? Are, are we really doing the things that are going to make that difference to, um, in, in people's lives? Um, it, it's, I mean, there's some big themes I've talked about here, but behind all, all of that are some really detailed operational plans. And, 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 um, and, and when you're talking about a strategy for Parkinson's rather than a strategy for the charity, your, your KPIs then need to be much more sophisticated, don't they? It's, you know, how, how do we measure whether we are really enabling people with Parkinson's to take control, for example. So we've had to work with universities, putting in place academic frameworks to, to, to give us a chance of being able to assess whether we, we've achieved that by, by 2020. 
We've had to reorganize. Um, this time last year, um, more than 50% of the organization were, were facing new job descriptions, new, a new focus um, for, for their roles, significant uncertainty, um, and, and that was a, a challenge. Um, new leaders are around um, all of this as, as well. Um, appointing David Byrne as our clinical director, recognizing that um, if we were going to inspire the clinicians in the UK to really get behind this initiative, we needed to appoint the very best clinician in the UK to, to lead and in, in inspire all of this. With our new research program, recognizing we needed a different model of research leadership, and so appointed Arthur Roach, who came from an industry background, who had that experience of leading the more commercial collaborations and partnerships that would, would be required. And because we see digital as a, as a massive um, way of enabling the, the, the strategy, um, appointing Julie, who's, who's, who's here, um, as, as our new director of digital transformation um, and communication, who can spearhead all of the initiatives that need to take place in, in, in this area to, to give us the best chance of delivering the, the strategy and, and future-proofing us um, as, as, as well. All, all of this um, requires, all of the money that we raise is, comes from voluntary donations. We've set ourselves the challenge of, of getting to 40 million pounds a year to, to support this, this program. So we have to be able to tell this story in a way that really engages and, and, and motivates and inspires um, people to, to want to support us and do silly things like jump out of, of aeroplanes. And, and of course, it's an ongoing process of, of listening, engaging, reflecting, refining. Um, it, we certainly haven't got it right and we're constantly making changes and, and, and I think a success of the strategy will be the extent to which we continue to, to do that over the next few, few years. So I'll leave it there. Um, I think I've taken the, the, the time, but I just wanted to, to give some sense of, of what we're trying to, trying to do um, at Parkinson's UK, but we desperately need the support, the ideas um, of the whole global um, community if, we, if we're going to make a success of this. But, but really happy to share with anybody any of the, the, the research, any of the findings, any of the thinkings that, that, that we've done around, um, around this, if, if that would be helpful for, for others. So thank you. I, I don't know, we might, I think just, if, if anyone's got any questions, perhaps just, just two questions. Um, or comments before we move on? No? That's good. Oh, I think, yeah, there's one at the right at the, the, um, at the front here. Thank you. Well, I admire what you're working on, and I think one thing that we lack, um, I'm a speech pathologist, and I notice that when, uh, with the American Speech Language Hearing Association, that we talk about how to get the better treatments, but we have to look at the business side of it. I don't know how it is in the UK, in the US, but the insurance and all that, and how we can be more efficient in getting better results, because all of that goes in line with what the treatments that people will get, whether yeah. they have access to everything that they need. But there's got to be another piece to any program we develop is the business side of it and how we're going to do it in an efficient way. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that's a really important point. I guess every, every health system has got different um, drivers, incentives within it, but demonstrating the economic value of services is really important. And I think, it's, I think it is true to say, certainly in the UK, that the value... I mean, we've even struggled, actually, to demonstrate the value of Parkinson's nurses. Um, from a, a pure kind of economic um, way. I'm sure if you talk to people with Parkinson's, um, they, 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 they wouldn't see it that way. So if, if, if it's been difficult with, with nurses, how much harder, I think, has it been with speech and language therapy, physio, OT? So that's a major focus for, for the network to be working across the whole of the UK to, to be developing more evidence around the, the interventions that those services can, can, can make. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank you, Movement Disorders, uh, for the uh, Brashov uh, application. And uh, I want to know if uh, they are thinking uh, to put leadership in uh, his uh, evidence. Well, I'm not sure. I think that was 
question for Oscar, wasn't it? But again, maybe whether you can talk to Oscar afterwards about perhaps what's happening in Romania. Was that the focus? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since it was in Romanian, it is a very powerful uh, meeting in Brasov right. in uh, April, and uh, it is a school of uh, movement disorders. Okay, brilliant. Good plug, thank you. Any, anybody else, or should we? Okay, there's just there's one in the, the what, what kind of use of telemedicine is there in the UK? I, I mean, I think it's, um, it, it's an emerging area. Certainly, if you go into to Scotland and, and the rural areas there, starting to use it quite kind of um, aggressively in terms of doing kind of consultations. Um, I think if we look at how we're using technology as for, for kind of objective measures of Parkinson's, I think that's an area that is starting to happen. Um, and again, you know, the Excellence Network has done some work around the, the PKG um, technology, for example, and the lessons that we can learn in, in introducing that. That's going to be a big priority for the future, I think, how we introduce technology to, to, to transform clinical care. Um, Okay, well, thanks um, very much. For our next session, we'd like to introduce Malcolm O.